Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Hello, brethren. God bless you. We've been having a wonderful study, and I've been sharing some testimonies with you, and I'd like to continue with that. Um, let's pray. Ask the Lord to be with us. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to grant us the grace that we need to perceive your kingdom and your ways, Lord. God, our soul cleaveth to the dust, as the Scripture says. We it's so natural for us to be the way of the world, but um, your ways and your principles are so much higher than our ways, and yet you've given us this grace, Lord, that we can walk out of the kingdom of this world and walk into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, we ask you, Lord, to help us to understand the principles of the kingdom, that we might walk in the kingdom. Uh, the supernatural principles that help us to walk above this world and to be preserved in this world. Uh, Father, we ask you, Lord, to have mercy upon all that are listening and uh, bless them to perceive that they were created for something more than this world and uh, more than being in bondage to the principles of this world. And um, thank you, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And obviously we are children of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, uh, a new creation man meant to live above this world, meant to walk in his ways and in his steps. We've been talking about the, the first fruits, the witnesses, those that are alive and remain. And uh, we came to a question here in our last meeting was that um, the main difference between the first fruits and the two witnesses, the first fruits goes through their wilderness first. They go through their wilderness and they learn to walk in the principles of the kingdom, basically, what the wilderness is all about. Moses was the first fruits. He went through a 40-year wilderness before he overcame to bring God's people through their own wilderness. And Jesus went through a 40-day wilderness before he overcame to bring um, God's people in his day through their wilderness. And uh, we, we spoke about what the wilderness actually is. You know, the wilderness is available to every Christian worldwide. It's not some geological place that we go to. It's a place in the Spirit. It's a place where we no longer depend upon the world. And the principles of the world uh, were instead ruled by the principles of the kingdom. And um, we no longer trust in the world for our sustenance, our salvation, our healings, our deliverances. We, like the Israelites who uh, left Egypt, could no longer depend upon them or the flesh pots of Egypt. You know, they were trust, learned to trust in the living God, or should have. Well, basically, folks, that's just a type and a shadow for us. We're going to just such a place. It's not physical, it's spiritual. And I want to tell you that everybody who walks by faith goes into the wilderness. Everybody who walks by faith in the commands and promises and principles of God automatically gives up salvation by works. You understand that salvation was for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body, and circumstances, and that the promises of God were meant to save us totally outside the principles of this world, and to save us in all those, those ways, spirit, soul, body, circumstances. Um, God already made promises of this. In fact, there's, there are promises that kind of catch all 
everything, you know. I, for instance, Mark 11 and 24. Let me read it to you. Therefore I say unto you, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, and that covers everything, right? Believe that you received them, past tense, and you shall have them. Why does Jesus tell us to believe that we've already received them? Well, obviously because everything that has to do with the salvation that the Lord gave us is past tense. You know, uh, for instance, in uh, 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who in his own self bear our sins. Notice that's past tense because it happened behind us, right? who in his own self bear our sins in his body upon the tree, that we, having died unto sins, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, past tense. <clears throat> we notice that, that all of the principles <clears throat> that had to do with the sacrifice were past tense. You know, uh, Ephesians 2 and 8, By grace have you been saved. That's what it says in the original, it's past tense. By grace have you been saved through faith, that's not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Have been saved. Colossians 1 and 13 speaks of Jesus delivering us out. You were delivered, past tense, out of the power of darkness. You were made free from sin, Romans chapter 6. So reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, again, Romans chapter 6. You see, folks, when you realize that the Lord has already done this, there's nothing you can really do in yourself to bring it to pass. You have to walk by faith in the fact that it's already accomplished. You are already healed. You are already delivered. You are already blessed. You are already provided for. All of these things were accomplished at the cross. And uh, we enter into the rest, the New Testament rest, which I'm sure many Christians don't know about, they think that it's a Saturday or a Sunday, but no, folks, I, I can tell you that the only place we're commanded to keep that Sabbath, it's a totally different word. It uses, for instance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. See, the promises cause us to enter the rest. You know why? Because the promises are past tense. And when you believe them, you have to stop your working to try to bring them to pass. The Bible says that we who have believed, verse 3, do enter into that rest, even as he has said. When we believe these promises, we enter into the rest. You cannot do anything to get healed if you believe that you were healed. See. The reason men run to man to get healing is because they don't believe Jesus already healed them. But I'm telling you something that I know. For the past 30 years, I've been getting healing because I realize that I don't have to get healing. I don't have to accomplish healing. I don't have to do anything to bring it to pass. All I've got to do is thank God for it. See, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals everybody that comes to him by faith. Did you notice in the Gospels? Everybody that came to Jesus got healed. Well, we have to come to him by faith now. But he's the same. If you accept what happened at the cross, and that is that you were healed, then there's nothing can keep you from getting his healing. So, down in verse um, chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The word Sabbath there is the word sabbatismos. It means a keeping of rest. It doesn't mean a day of rest. This is the Sabbath that remains for the people of God. It's a keeping of rest. Every day we have to rest from our own works. We have to cease from our own works every day. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For he that hath entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from his. God 
doesn't want our works. He doesn't believe in salvation by works, whether you're talking about your spirit, your soul, your body, or your circumstances. It's not by self-effort. The Apostle Paul taught us in, uh, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that the Lord said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you understand, folks, that when we get out of the business of trying to save ourselves, God's very powerful to do it. Paul spoke about the things he went through in the previous chapter. You know, a lot of people want to say that the, um, the thorn in the flesh uh, was his eyes or whatever, you know. But actually, it, it tells us that it is a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he tells you exactly what the messenger of Satan did in the previous chapter, chapter 11. And what's he talk about? Well, he talk, talks about uh, a hungering and thirsting and cold and nakedness and, and um, beaten with rods and stoned and uh, in journeyings and perils of rivers, perils of robbers, perils of his countrymen, all these things all these situations he was getting into and you know what in his weakness god was made powerful he called it his weakness in verse 29 of that chapter who is weak and i'm not weak and who is caused to stumble and i burn not if i must needs glory i will glory in the things that concern my weaknesses well folks we need to do the same thing because it worked for paul it didn't seem like it mattered whatever situation he got into the Lord delivered him. And now I tell you, there's a lot of Christians today that get into situations and they don't seem to get deliverance. Second Timothy 3, listen to what Paul said. But thou didst follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, patience, persecutions, sufferings, what things befell me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Why is that? Because he was weak. He wasn't trying to save himself. He gave himself into the hands of God, and he gave up his own works, basically because he believed the promise of God. You know, it didn't end there. I mean, uh, next chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work, and will save me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. When he meant save, he meant save like the Bible uses the word. The word is sozo. And the word sozo is used for salvation, like I was saying, spirit, soul, body, and circumstances. The word sozo was used for deliverance from demons, for healing the body, for soul salvation, for saving the disciples when they were in the boat, and the, and the wind and the waves were sinking the boat. They said, save, Lord, and he saved them. And, and so Paul's using that word in the, the way that the Hebrews used that word. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work. Do you believe that? See, we're going to a wilderness now, folks. You can, you can enter into it by faith, by trusting in the promises of God, because God cannot fail you if you believe in his promises. Or you can be forced into it with the church in the coming tribulation. I'm telling you, if you walk by faith now, you're walking into that spiritual wilderness. I started sharing with you in our last meeting some testimonies that the Lord gave me. He told me many, many years ago, he said to me, I'm sending you through a wilderness so that you can tell my people that I still supply there. And I want to tell you folks, he has proven that to me. He put me in a position of weakness I started telling you how that he wouldn't 
wouldn't let me. Of course, I saw it in the scriptures. He wouldn't let me take up offerings because they only took up offerings for other people in the scriptures. They didn't take them up for themselves. None of the disciples did that. Uh, he wouldn't let me tell my personal needs. He wouldn't let me store up my treasures upon earth. He wouldn't let me borrow money. You know, he wouldn't let me sell things. He wouldn't let me take any government benefits. You know, he put me in a position of weakness, and yet, through all of that, I've never, I haven't worked for man, and I haven't taken any worldly benefits. And God has sustained me, paid for everything, all the way through it. He put me in a position of weakness. He put me in a wilderness, basically, that has nothing to do with a physical wilderness. And he's never failed to meet our needs. I shared with you last time how that um, I raised five kids. Um, they didn't know doctors. They didn't know medicine. They didn't know anything but the power of God. And um, God always preserved, always fed them. I told you one time my kids, the Lord put a fast on them. I mean, it wasn't their doing. And uh, it was one of those trials, you know. But, you know, for... All of these years, God has faithfully met our needs, fed us, paid our bills, made sure our lights stayed on, our gas stayed on, so on and so forth. He's been totally, totally faithful. And I want to tell you that the wilderness is not as bad as you've heard. Uh, yes, we are all going into a wilderness, but it's one that God made, and he made it for our good. He is separating us from the world. He is behind the mark of the beast. He is behind the beast kingdom to force us into this coming wilderness. The whole world's going to hate us, going to separate from us. We won't have the help of Egypt, just like Israel didn't have the help of Egypt. We're going to be thrust upon the mercy of God and the grace of God. And the only thing we really need to be sustained is to repent of our sins and believe his word. And when we believe, it will put us in a position of weakness, but also in a position where God is prone to answer. You know, I want to tell you, I want to continue with a few testimonies. I want to share one with you. You know, we got, in our walk of faith, we got into places where God tried us. You know, Paul talked about hungering and thirsting. God brought him to the place where he was tried. But notice, he didn't starve to death. <laughs> he, he, uh, he overcame in the trial. God did the same thing with the Israelites. He brought them to a place of lack to see if they were going to walk by faith or they were going to complain. Uh, sadly, they, they failed God as the natural man always does, you know. Uh, but, folks, we have something new in the New Testament. We have a born-again experience. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, some people are going to go through this wilderness like Joshua and Caleb. They're going to be victorious, and they're going to be walking in the steps of Jesus Christ. Well, anyway, um, I was, I think I was getting ready to tell you the last time before we ran out of time, how the, the Lord actually multiplied food for us. And um, I can remember one time in particular that we'd run out of everything in the house except spaghetti <laughs> we had some spaghetti so my wife basically made a, a pot of spaghetti and uh we we prayed over that pot because we didn't have anything else but we weren't even considering that god wasn't going to bring any more because he'd been doing this for us for quite some time and uh you know after a while you know what happens when you get tried over and over and over and you see that god's faithful when you hold fast to your confession and hold fast the word you enter into the rest you don't even worry about it anymore you just rest in him because you become hardened to your flesh you become hardened to the world you become hardened to temptation tribulation worketh patience the bible says it's a good place that we're going folks and you're going to enjoy it matter of fact i've enjoyed the tribulation the tribulation is trial on the flesh but it's so neat to see god being a personal God and loving you enough to look after everything. And he really wants to do that. He doesn't want to share his glory with man. 
And yet that's what he's been having to do, you know, with his people because they always run to the world. They always run to Egypt and its methods and its ways, you know. Well, anyway, my wife um, cooked up this pot of spaghetti, and it was a fairly big pot, but it was about three-quarters full when we blessed it. And um, and uh, we started eating, and we probably ate that pot down to lower than half way. And we didn't think about it. We just shoved it in the refrigerator. And um, the next day, we got it out again, and God had filled that pot back up again. I mean, everything we'd eaten the day before was back in there. And my wife took the lid off the pot. She looked down in there, and I looked down in there, and she said, David, do you remember that the spaghetti was was down to here? <laughs> yeah, she made a mark on the side. I said, "Yeah, I remember that." <laughs> the Lord had put that, put it all back in there, folks. You know, God is awesome. You can't get anywhere where He can't supply. Think about those Israelites. I mean, look, He brought them water out of a rock, folks. And uh, I, I've actually seen the pictures of people that believe that they've discovered this. This rock, I saw the pictures of the rock, and um, the water table actually had come up above the the ground of the desert there and gone up into these rocks and come out of this rock up in the in a pile of rocks. You know, I thought, that looks impossible. But there it was, and all the water markings there and everything. God can bring you water in the middle of a wilderness, and he can bring you uh, taxes out of a fish's mouth, and he can bring you flesh out of the sky and bread out of the sky. You know, our God, if he can bring several million Israelites through a wilderness like that and feed them, just think what he can do with us who are filled, actually filled with his spirit. Well, anyway, um, we had quite a few really good experiences like that. I had another one that I thought was more, even more awesome, and this one made me realize that you just can't get anywhere where God can't feed you. You just cannot get anywhere where God can't feed you. And that is, we come to another situation like that where we had run out of everything in the house. And um, and my wife said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, you know the Lord set us here. He says, yeah. I said, you set the table, and we'll go sit down at the table, and we'll eat, you know. So she set the table, and uh, myself and... And, uh, and her and our five kids sat around the table with these empty plates. And I prayed a real simple prayer, the only kind I really know. And uh, I said, Father, uh, you sent us here, and we're asking you to please fill these plates or fill our tummies. That's just the way it came out of my mind. You know, I'm sure the Lord put it in there because he wanted to show me something, you know. Because he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So... Uh, the prayer no longer got out of my mouth hardly than um, I looked around the table and my oldest son, was I think, was the first one to speak. And he said, Dad, I'm full. I don't need to eat. And um, pretty soon another one said it, and another one, and another one. And then I realized I was full too. And I thought, isn't that something? You know, the Lord didn't have to multiply anything. If he multiplied anything, he multiplied it in our stomachs. But um, he filled us all up sitting there at the table. I thought, you know, if God can do that, you can't get anywhere where he can't take care of you, you know? And that's the truth, folks. I mean, if, if our God will supply our every need according to his riches and glory, it has nothing to do with the economy, the surroundings. If you're in a desert, it has nothing to do with any of that. God made the promise. He's the one that stands behind it, and he will take care of you. I remember quite a few times we prayed for, for certain things. You know, I, I remember one time in particular. Now, we talk about weakness. Let me tell you something about weakness. There was a time, one time I decided, I decided, wasn't the Lord, but I decided, I was going to grow some tomatoes. See, really, God didn't call me to grow tomatoes. He called me to study the Word of God and, and go out and share it with His people. And uh, so I just decided, well, I'll take this hobby on. I'll plant some tomatoes. My, I have a, a house here under a lot of big oak trees, and we don't have any, any sunshine in my yard except for one place. And um, so I, 
I, I got a bunch of five gallon cans and I planted these tomatoes in these five gallon cans and you know I did them upright you know I, I learned to study a little bit how to do them and I, so I, I got them so I could move them you know as the season went on the, the sun would move and I would move these pots if I had to you know the thing was lots of little tomatoes popped out but they didn't hardly get to be any size at all before the birds just came and took them all away and I said and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why'd you, why'd you let that happen? The Lord said, I didn't call you to plant tomatoes. That was your idea. I've got other things for you to do. Now, now get about what I told you to do. And uh, so I did. Yes, sir. You know, and um, you know what happened next day? I didn't say anything. I didn't. Uh, we never told anybody our needs whatsoever. But there was a, a lady that was acquainted with us who was going to a local uh, tomato farm to get her tomatoes for her family. And uh, when she was out there picking these monster tomatoes, she, the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to pick a bag of these for, for David Eels. I said, okay. So she bought me a, a great big bag of the biggest, most luscious looking tomatoes I've seen in a long, long time. I couldn't have grown anything like that, you know. And, and you know, what the Lord was just kind of rubbing my nose in it, you know, when this lady brought these the next day. I didn't say anything to her, but the Lord put it in her heart. She brought them by. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I really couldn't have done anything like that, Lord. And, and basically the Lord showed me that I had to come to that place of weakness before he would do this miracle. And he kept, he's always done miracles like that. We, you know, I mean, I remember one time that uh, we prayed one morning. We needed certain things. We've done this many times, but if we prayed one morning, we asked the Lord to send us poultry, send us mayonnaise, and send us cheese. Those three things. Didn't tell anybody, didn't tell a soul. You know, this is the way God gets the glory. If you go out, you know, I remember, uh, I remember I had a, a brother that was um, an elder in the church with me many years ago who, who used to be a part of the prosperity movement. And, um, they would go out there and brag about what God was going to do. You know, they would tell everybody, I'm believing God for this, or I'm believing God for that. Well, pretty soon somebody would feel like um, they see their brother in need, they, they need to have compassion on them, right? So they would bring it to them. But, hey, God don't get any glory like that. When you ask God for something, just believe him. Just believe him. And uh, then when it comes, boy, he gets the credit, you know? Well, you know, we really didn't tell anybody about this but that day and the next day all three of those things came literally we had a friend that was going out of town and she had this great big jar of mayonnaise in her refrigerator she said she didn't want to leave it there i don't know why it was just her mayonnaise i didn't understand that you know but it didn't make any difference so she bought us this big jar of mayonnaise because she was going out of town and uh, another person brought us uh, a turkey the poultry and uh, the cheese it was specifically what we'd asked from God. You say, would God do that for me, David? I guarantee you, God is no respecter of persons. He is a respecter of faith, but he's no respecter of persons. He won't do anything for me that he won't do for you. I'm just trying to teach you how to be weak and to exercise faith at the same time so that you're in this ideal position in the wilderness to see miracles from God. Well, we've got so many of these over the years, I've forgotten most of them. But I can tell you that he consistently met our needs, and we saw many, many, many miracles. I, I remember one time, I like to share this because it just tickles me. I've shared it many times about how that my children all wanted to go camping one day. Now, I, you know, I'd when I was a kid, I, I did so much camping, I, I had enough of it. You know, I liked my bed, you know. <laughs> but they wanted to go camping, and, and I was making up excuses, you know. But one thing wasn't really an excuse. I mean, I told them the, the, the woods that they wanted to go to, uh, I had been back there with my kids before walking through the woods, and I told them, I said, there's nothing back there to start a fire with, and, and really we don't have any permission to cut down any of those trees back there or anything like that, you know. Oh, Daddy. You know, okay, okay, okay. So I gave in, and we decided to go. We packed up our tent and so on and so forth, and we took off into the woods, out in the middle of the woods. 
and we picked a campsite that was in a little opening in the in the woods and uh, there was a a tree down there there wasn't many trees down in these woods you know but there was a tree down there we set up our tent and i sent out the kids to go to go and uh bring firewood well they they went out in the woods and everything they saw was rotten and you know little twigs and branches and bark off of trees and things like that they drug back and uh, i said that stuff just just makes smoke it doesn't really make fire you know and uh so i sent them out again and um the, the 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 floor of the woods was just covered with leaves. Everything was covered with leaves there, you know. And I I walked a little bit away from the camp. I was kind of praying, asking the Lord to provide for us. And I actually told my kids before we going back. I said the only thing I hate about going back there is no place. There's no wood back there. There's no place, nothing to use for burnt, uh, for a fire, you know. And we can't cut down other people's trees, you know. So I walked away from the from the tent just a little bit, just a few feet, you know, maybe 20, 30 feet. And uh, as I was walking, I came across this little lump on the ground, you know, it was just a, a lump in the, in, the, in the leaves, actually, and kicked it as I walked through it and hit something solid. So I backed up and I raked all the leaves off and, and there was a, a pillowcase on the ground. And I pulled the pillowcase back and, and there was a Poland chainsaw on the ground. And I thought, wow, isn't that something? So wouldn't it be something that this would crank, you know? Because we had a tree down right there by the campsite. There wasn't many of them down in that in those woods, you know, but there was one right there by the campsite. And I, and I thought, wouldn't it be something that this crank? And sure enough, it cranked. And we cut up plenty enough wood to, to have a really good fire the whole time we were there. And I tell you, when I, when I did that, when that thing cranked and I cut that wood up, I got to thinking, I says, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. I repent, because I said, you basically couldn't supply us with wood back here. And um, and would, there wouldn't be a way to cut it up. God, out in the middle of the woods, God had somebody plant a chainsaw back there waiting for us. Because you see, God sees the end from the beginning. He's done dwell in time. He has no problem meeting your needs. He will have it there when you get there. That's the neat thing about God. See, he answers before we call because he can have our provision already there or he can manufacture it. It makes no difference to him. See, God has already got people preparing for what's coming, folks. He's got me preparing in one way. He's got other people preparing in other ways. There are people that are preparing uh, communities out there for you to go to, places of refuge, you know. Now, God didn't call me to do that. He called me to multiply the fishes and the loaves. You know, Jesus, Jesus basically, um, he brought the disciples into the wilderness. They translated the same word desert. He brought them into the wilderness, but he multiplied the food there. See, basically, Jesus was raising up disciples. He was showing them. He was the teacher. He was showing them, this is how you do it. And they went off into their tribulation, the book of Acts, and they repeated what they saw. The man-child, who was Jesus, was, um, was God's provision in the wilderness. Nothing's changed. God's going to do it again. He's just going to repeat it with a larger group of people, but he's going to do it again. I remember one time my, uh, my little girl, I, called, I taught my kids, we prayed for everything. You know, since we didn't really have a big worldly income at the time, um, we prayed for everything, and God brought it. You, you try it sometimes. You don't. You can have a good income and still. I did this back before I started my full time ministry. Uh, we would. We decided we were going to stop using money for the things that we need. We we're going to start praying for it. We started praying for it, and saw God just do miracles. We would use the money for his kingdom. Things that you normally would use money to buy, we would just stop and pray for it. And God would bring it. And, uh, you know, there's different ways you can enter into this wilderness, but all of them give you confidence that when you get out there, God's going to be there and he's going to supply your needs. So I've been teaching, I taught my children this, you know, you know, to, to pray. If you need something, pray for it. 
put faith in God and it honors him, it builds your faith, you know, and so on and so forth. So I had my daughter come to me one day, my youngest daughter. She was very small. And um, she um, basically she had a, a, a swimming pool that had cracked up the year before and wouldn't hold water anymore. Her son had cracked it up. One of these small wading type pools because she was just a little baby, you know. <laughs> and she said, Daddy, uh, she brought me a, a Sears catalog. And she said, Daddy, I need a swimming pool. And she started looking at the, in the catalog. And I said, well, Betty, you know, you know where we get in? Everything like that, don't you? And she says, yeah. She says, well, you pay for me for one like this, you know? Well, you know, God can give you something better than what you pay for, can't he? Can't he? So we prayed. She looked at one, and we prayed, and we agreed in faith that God was going to bring that, that swimming pool. And, uh, you know, I think it was a week maybe two weeks, but I think it was only a week later that we were all in the house here and uh, there came a knock on the door and my wife went and answered the, the door and I heard a lady's voice and she said, I, I'm looking for I'm looking for two little boys that have come down and cut my grass. I live about five blocks from here on the other end of the golf course and I, I'm looking for these boys that cut my grass and, and and then she looked past my wife, and she saw one of my boys, and she said, oh, I see I found the right place, you know. She was looking, but didn't, you know, just from my boy's general idea, it's amazing that she found us, actually, because they didn't really give her a good description of where we lived, so. But the Lord led her right to our door. And uh, she said, I'd like, I'd like to uh, make a proposition with you boys. She said, um, I've got this swimming pool. And it was, it was a nice one. She said, it's, it's still in the box. It's in, still in the boxes. It's an above ground pool. It's a, I think a three and a half foot pool. It's got the filter and it's got the, 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 uh, the ladder and it's got the pump and it's got all, everything that goes with it. Everything's already, it's still there. She says, and I bought it to exercise. I was going to set it up in my garage and exercise in it, but I decided I'm not going to do that. So if you'll cut, our, cut my grass a couple of times, I'll give that to you. Well, boy, they were just happy to do that, you know. And and uh, they did. They cut the grass, and they set the pool up, and they just had a good old time in that thing for several years. And, of course, um, Jennifer, my daughter, she was just overjoyed to see God answer her prayer that quickly. Kids don't get over that, folks. They just remember that. You know, it comes back to them. Even if they go out in the world... You know, they remember that God is real and that he keeps his word. And um, one day that'll God will use that on to bring them back. Well, anyway, we, we had a, a tremendous life like this. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, but the very fact that we didn't have a lot of money made us depend upon God. And in depending upon God, we got to see these awful miracles, awesome miracles. You know, uh, we never borrowed money. That was one other thing that God did to put us in a position of weakness. You know, we didn't we didn't borrow any money because the Bible promises in um, in Deuteronomy 28. It said, "They shall lend, but they shall not borrow. They shall lend unto many nations, but they shall not borrow." And um, you know, uh, Romans 13 tells us that. Uh, Owe no man anything but love. And um, so we took God at his word. We figured if we don't borrow, again, we're weak, but God will be strong. If you can't borrow money, then God can come through. And I got some tremendous miracles to share with you concerning not borrowing and uh, seeing God answer. The Bible, you know, the Bible teaches against suretyship. And uh, I know... That uh, you, you say, how could it be that we would not mortgage and that God would answer? Well, I've got some answers for you, and I may share them between this time and the next meeting. But for one thing, let me show you what the Bible says in, say, Proverbs chapter 11, okay? Proverbs chapter 11, and verse 15, it says, He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it. But he that hateth suretyship is secure. Now, surety, if you look up the word, it actually means 
the Hebrew word here, it actually means to give or to be security, to mortgage. In other words, it's borrowing and guaranteeing to pay back. Well, you know, we, we can't really guarantee we're going to be here tomorrow. And the Bible warns us against making promises or pledges or guarantees that we're commanded against that. Because uh, you can't make one hair of your head white or black. And uh, you can't guarantee tomorrow. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And anything that's more than this is of the evil one. Promising and pledging, we who do we think we are? God, you know? So basically, mortgaging was something that was foreign to the Israelites. He, he told them that they would lend unto many nations, but they would not borrow. And uh, actually, the Bible tells us, let me show you a couple of other verses. One is uh, Proverbs 17 and 18. A man void of understanding striketh hands. That's the way to seal the, the agreement. And becometh surety in the presence of his neighbor. A man void of understanding is someone that does this. Uh, in other words, it's not wise. I mean, I know the world does it. I know it's a principle of the world, but also the economies of the world are all going to crumble because of it. Because they're not obeying God's principles. Besides that, look how much faith God's people would have if they were put into the position where they couldn't run to the world to borrow all the money. First of all, they would see miracles. You know why? Nobody waits on God to see a miracle. They're too quick to run back to Egypt. I know for a fact. You say, well, well, how would we receive homes? Just the same way I received a home. And I know God is not a respecter of persons. The home I'm, I'm in right now, God gave to me because I refused to borrow money. And I believed Him. And that's why I've got it. And it didn't cost me a thing. God is sovereign. I'll share, I will may share that with you next time. It would take too long, this meeting, you know. Uh, let me tell you, share this verse with you, Proverbs 22 and verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You know, when you get, when you borrow money, you're no longer a steward of what you have. It belongs to someone else. Jesus said, if you don't renounce everything you have, you can't be my disciple. We renounce ownership. We are only stewards. But a steward who belongs to a bank is not a steward for the Lord. The borrower is servant to the lender. The rich rule over the poor. The rich, rich are running this world, folks, because they've got everybody's money. You know, the Bible says and further down in this chapter, verse 26, Be thou not one of them that striketh hands, or of them that are sureties for death. If thou hast not wherewith to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? <laughs> That's kind of curious. Well, Proverbs speaks a lot against suretyship, and, uh, and it gets ignored a lot. But I tell you what, I would have never seen the miracles that I've seen if I would have borrowed the money instead of learning just to ask God. You know, when God gives us such awesome promises, like we just read Mark 11, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe that you received them and you shall have them. If we got a promise like that, why would we borrow money and have to pay back for years and years in bondage with interest. God forbid the Israelites interest, mortgaging, those kind of things. He forbid them. It was when they went to Babylon that they got caught back into it. It was when, um, well, never mind, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Listen, if we can just ask God and wait on God, you think, well, well, God might not answer. Well, that's not faith. He said, believe you received them. That's not faith. Let me tell you something else. The Bible doesn't teach borrowing to get money. It teaches giving to get money. Luke 6 and 38. 
give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Well, I've proven that many, many times. I've proven that. You can, you can make a living by giving. I mentioned that last time. You give, and God will give it back to you multiplied. Doesn't the Scripture teach it? Now, I, I shared with you that the Scripture doesn't teach going under the law, but it, it does teach multiplying your money. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. See, people want to reap, but they don't want to sow. But the Bible teaches you got to sow. You give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. He said, Let each man do according as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound unto you. That's awesome. All grace abound unto you, that you may have having always all sufficiency, always all sufficiency in everything. Isn't that something? Just for giving bountifully, God will make sure that you have always all sufficiency in everything and may abound unto every good work. As it is written, he hath scattered abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness abideth forever. And he that supplieth seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. You see, some people uh, don't really believe this, so they're stingy and they try to hoard up. That's not the way for God to multiply it. you got to sow it. Think about sowing that one little seed and what it brings forth. It multiplies, see? you got to multiply it. And even if you're poor, you will have all of your needs met. I'm not talking about rich and poor the way the world sees it, but the way the kingdom sees it, you know? I mean, Jesus was rich because everywhere he went, he had his needs met. And the disciples, too, they had their needs met. They didn't have any need for the riches of the world. These were just distractions to them. They had no need for that, no love of that. But they needed their needs met wherever they went, and that happened. And it happened because they were givers, not because they were borrowers. Borrowers just keep put you deeper in debt. Giving gets you out of debt. And, of course, I'm not preaching giving to me. I'm just preaching giving, see, because I never have done that, never have, never had to, you know. But there have been times when, many times, when I saw that what I had would not meet my need. The money that I had would not cover my bills. And this happened to me so many times, uh, it's hard for me to give you an instance because it happened to me so many times that I would just take the money and go give it. And in giving it, it would come back multiplied. And I want to tell you that you think, well, if I give it, maybe it won't come back in time. Listen, God is not... I told you, God doesn't dwell in, t in time. He answers before we call. When you ask him to do something, he's going to do it. So don't worry about it. This happened to me many times that I've gone out, for instance, to, to put the money in the mailbox and send it to somebody in need. And gone to the same mailbox, and it was multiplied in the same mailbox. Well, you say, well, we don't give in order to receive. Listen, that's, that's, that's moot. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. If you do give, you will receive. And that's God's promise. So what we need to do, if we want to make money, even if we don't have a lot of money, is make sure we meet the needs of the brother. That's the most important thing, is to meet the needs of the brother. Uh, meet the needs of the kingdom. You know, to, to spread the word of God. Meet the needs of the kingdom. If we'll do that, God will see to our needs. I, I shared with you last time how that, that they, they stored up under Joseph in the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine. And Joseph was Jesus. Jesus said, don't store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust and thieves break through and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven. And in Luke 12, he tells us how to do that. He said, give alms. Meet the needs of the brethren. Make for yourselves purses that wax not old. And you'll have a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, faileth not. 
So give, and God will give to you. Probably next time I'll share with you about how the Lord made me give my house away. He didn't make me do it. He put it in my heart to do it. And when I did that, he, he gave me the house I'm in now. And, um, you know, you, you, you can't outgive God. You just cannot do it. Uh, buying and selling, folks, is not the way of the kingdom. I mean, I know a lot of ministries that do that. that that's their big thing. They sell stuff and they buy stuff. But you see, we have a, a different economy in the kingdom. Why did God rebuke them in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot for buying and selling? They bought, they sold. They married, they gave in marriage. What was wrong with buying and selling? It's just not the kingdom. The kingdom is giving and receiving. You get, you get a reward for giving. You get none for selling. You get none for borrowing. You get a reward, specifically, the Bible says, for giving. And the interest is much better. <laughs> he said, good measure, press down, shaken together and running over. Try God on this. I have. It works. He is faithful, consistently faithful. He is our surety. I learned many, many times like this. You just give. You meet the needs of the brethren around you. Don't worry about what you got left. Because God's never going to fail you. Never, never going to fail you. I didn't borrow any money for 32 years. From the time the Lord showed me about faith and uh, debt and how he forbid debt to his people, I didn't borrow any money happened in those years. And you know what? The Lord has never failed. I, and I never stored it up. That's the neat thing. But the Lord's never failed to make sure we had a good car and a good house. And, and our needs met. He's never failed. And you would think, well, wouldn't you have to store up the money until you... No, you don't. Because God can bring it in a lump sum. He did it to us many times. Many times. Or brought the car or the vehicle or whatever, you know. When I moved here, he bought us a brand new car. When he gave us this house, he bought us a brand new car. It didn't cost us anything. Maybe I'll share that with you next time. But, you know, it's an exciting life in the wilderness it's not the fear you know it's fearful to somebody that's not a believer of course but don't worry about it folks the non-believers aren't going out in that wilderness i mean they're not going to go very far in it anyway now, many of them are going to take the mark of the beast because they don't believe that they could live out there you see but it's not a fearful place it's a very joyous place you know, because you feel the closeness of your father. You know that he's taking care of you. You know that he's watching over everything. You know, when you pray for, you know, uh, poultry, cheese, and, and mayonnaise, and it comes within the next day, you know God is very specifically watching over you, you know. And we had many such things as that. Uh, I remember one time I... My youngest daughter, this is, this one tickled us just really. It was something. My youngest daughter was angry because my two boys went camping and they took all the chips with them. And uh, she was back there chewing on my wife's ear back in the washroom. And my wife finally just told her, says, well, you go pray to God and, and get your own. Well, she was walking out of the washroom, walking into the, the den, and there came a knock on the door. And you know what she said? No, we didn't know who was at the door or anything. She said, it's here, it's here, it's here already. That's childlike faith, you know. She, she'd made the four or five steps away from the washroom into the dining room, and the knock on the door, she said, it's here already. My wife went in there and grabbed her, you know, and shushed her up, you know. And uh, the door opened. And this was a, a neighbor that lived over behind us. There's a guy that, that comes, came to our Bible study at that time uh, for some years. And um, they always liked my wife's cornbread. So she had made a pan of cornbread and um, gave it, given it to this man to take home to his family. Well, he's coming back 
the next day with the pan, and it's um, it's all wrapped up in tinfoil, and he, he hands it to my wife, and my wife peels the tinfoil back, and guess what's there? <laughs> Chips. <laughs> you know, now see, this guy had to start walking two blocks from behind us. He got to our door when she had already prayed this prayer. See, God answers before we call. He doesn't dwell in time. He's not limited to time. You can ask God for something tomorrow that if he only knew about it today, you would think it's impossible. But he doesn't. He hears it all. From the beginning of time, he's seen it all. See? And so, now this guy never knew what, what happened, you know. But, of course, and it wasn't a big thing for my little girl. My little girl was just, just tickled, but, you know, that's childlike faith. It's here. It's here already. You know, <laughs> my wife said, shut up. <laughs> well, I tell you, that's exciting. Um, and, and God wants to do these things for us. You see, he designed the wilderness to meet our needs, to build our faith, and he's doing it through weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.